Hey guys, it's Celestia, and while I apologize for the lack of video last week, I can at least make it up to you by giving you two this week. In addition to today's video, I'll be posting a tour of my old traditional art, as was requested on Twitter, which I had a really fun, cringy time going through and compiling. But for today's video, I'm not only doing a formal review of the Vague VK1200 drawing monitor, which is the tablet I'm currently doing a giveaway for, but I'll also be sharing a story time with you guys about my time on Amino, everyone's favorite platform to hate, and my opinion on on why everyone hates it and why they're right to. But before we get on to the endless ranting that's become more and more characteristic of me as a person with every passing year, let's talk about the tablet used to make today's piece, because let me tell you, I was not emotionally prepared for it to be as nice as it is. It has six shortcut keys which make undoing strokes you mess up a hell of a lot easier, and as you can see from watching literally any of my videos, undoing strokes I mess up makes up about 50% of what I do while drawing, so it made my life a lot easier. It's also the first tablet I've ever used that comes with a cleaning cloth and a drawing glove, which was a pleasant surprise. I didn't actually use either because I want to keep it as sanitary and unused as possible for the giveaway winner, but they're awesome either way. Also, potentially most importantly, as someone who's used a great many tablet monitors, I'm very picky as to any degree of lag between my tablet pen and the actual drawing, and there's absolutely none with this one. It's super smooth, it's lightweight enough to hold comfortably while you work, it has a matte finish on the screen so you don't have to worry about glare and it's one of the few tablets out there that has easy to install and use drivers that let you use it instantly without having to struggle for three hours, uninstalling and reinstalling and googling and yearning for the sweet release of death. Ultimately, it's a fantastic tablet, well worth the price, and I would recommend it to anyone. Like, literally anyone. Never use a drawing monitor? Use this one. Used a million drawing monitors and want a new one? Use this one. There is no circumstance in which the VK1200 is a bad call, for real, and I'm not even being paid to say that. But moving on, because I'll never shut up if I don't, let's get into the beautiful, borderline unbelievable story of my experience on Amino. Now, I'm not going to tell you any details about the Amino itself, because while I'm not the biggest fan of its current staff, I still respect them and wish them the best, so I'd rather not bring any negative attention to their community. I also won't be talking about any of the current staff, only the former ones who have long since disappeared from the internet, so on the off chance that someone figures out what Amino this took place on, please know that none of the leaders or curators on there now are the people that I'm talking about today. I'm still gonna give them all aliases though for the sake of the story, just in case. Alright, so, it's October 1st, 2017, and 19-year-old Celestia had recently discovered an amino for one of her favorite... things? I guess I probably shouldn't get any more specific than that. And after a few weeks of hanging out there, I applied to be curator. Which, for those of you who don't know, is basically just a moderator, but with a different title because amino demands special snowflake status wherever possible. And I was accepted. I was so excited to be a curator that I literally still remember the day I was promoted, which is as upsetting for me as it no doubt is for you. Anyway, after that promotion, I was put on what was called a curator trial, along with a bunch of other people, to see how we performed our duties, which would determine whether or not we would stay on as permanent staff after. This trial ended up going on for over three months, as a side note, which is utterly ridiculous given that the standard is two weeks at the longest, but whatever. Being on trial meant that I got to know the senior staff team very well, which at this point in time consisted of three leaders, which are basically big moderators, with the power to ban and strike users, and two curators. I'll call the leaders Regina, Stella, and Iris, and I'll call the curators May and Eve. All of these fake names actually do throw back to their real names, but I think there's maybe one person listening that will be able to put together how, and that's because she's Eve and she was there for all of it. Anyway, here's the really fun, totally believable fact that's gonna set the tone for the entire story. And it's that of these five staff members, four of them supposedly knew each other in real life. Regina and Stella lived together, Iris was their friend who was currently out of the country, and May was Regina's sister. This was surprising enough for me to learn, so imagine my further surprise when they started sharing their life stories. Because let me tell you, not one of these totally different real people was anything less than an anime protagonist and character archetype. Regina was your all-around main character personality-wise, with the added bonus of also being a formal model and idol in Japan. Stella was the classic acts peppy and upbeat but secretly has a dark side, and was an actual, literal spy. A government agent. A hacker who stole cars and killed people. Like, let me pull up a screenshot of her talking about having been busy killing people as if she were discussing the weather. Regina also occasionally worked with Stella as a spy, but only doing tech stuff, so that, that checks out. Iris was a tsundere through and through, and was a rich, famous lawyer at age 18, 
with a huge inheritance and was also in art school and was also a professional pianist. Finally, May, as I mentioned, was Regina's younger sister, who was also a tsundere but meaner, maybe more kudere, and she was literally never online despite being a curator, except to handle problematic users, which was pretty much anyone that the staff team didn't like. And the way that she handled them was to hide their profiles with the note under investigation, which essentially hides all of the person's images on their profile and gives them a huge red bar at the top of it that says they violated the guidelines. And to be clear, these users were never investigated. They were just hidden forever. And these ridiculous people told equally ridiculous stories. Off the top of my head, one fun little memory of their beautiful tales is the time that Stella hacked one of these problematic users that was pissing off the staff team, found his address, and she and Regina went over to his home and beat him with a frying pan. Then there was the time that Stella live-blogged stealing a car from a gas station to us, or the time that Regina told me that Stella had found my address and would be watching over me, and that if I hear a noise on my balcony, just wave, because it's just her checking up on me. Now, this all sounds unbelievable as hell when you write it down and read it out like I'm doing right now, but the reveal of these details and stories was so gradual and slow that it didn't actually feel unbelievable at the time. They were all online at once and talking to each other. They sent selfies sometimes, although one of which was stolen from a Japanese idol upon further investigation, and the other was intentionally blurry with the face covered. And I had bought jewelry from Regina's online store and knew her real name and address as a result. So I figured, I don't know, that if she was fabricating four whole entire lives, she wouldn't give her real info out to one of the people she was lying to who could just research her and learn the truth. But she was either unbelievably stupid or an absolute genius, because for quite some time, I was so confident that she wouldn't be that stupid that I didn't look into any of her information at all whatsoever. But the point here is that there were a lot of reasons not to completely doubt everything that came out of any of their mouths, as crazy as it sounds when you list it out like this. I obviously didn't believe that Stella actually killed people or committed constant crimes with no consequence, but I kind of assumed that she was just lying to look cool, both to us and to the other leaders she knew in real life. I mean, when I was 12, I remember being so desperate for attention and concern that I told my online friends that I had gotten stabbed on my walk and was just treating it with duct tape while waiting for my pizza pockets to cook, so I kind of assumed that it was the same energy. Anyway, around this time, Regina and I had started talking more just us rather than in the staff chat, and we kind of bonded. I considered her a friend, and we opened up to each other about a lot of personal stuff, which on her end included the fact that she was dying. She had terminal cancer and very severe heart problems, and she estimated that she had at most three months left to live. Which, by the way, she ended up miraculously living past indefinitely and with no explanation or even acknowledgement, but anyway. Over time, she started venting to me about how Stella and May were helping her buy food and pay rent because of her medical bills, but that she hated being a burden on them and she was running out of money. Apparently Iris and her massive inheritance and famous lawyer salary couldn't help out, but that's beside the point, I guess. Anyway, I started buying more and more of her jewelry to try to help her out, but because I genuinely cared about her, I was really worried that that wouldn't be enough. And honestly, I thought these were the last months of her life, and I just wanted to make them as good as possible. So I started sending her more money. By the time things finally reached a point where I couldn't convince myself to believe her lies anymore, I had sent her over $350 at a time in my life where my savings account had a negative balance, and the moment my financial situation changed for the better, I offered to send her anywhere from $1 to $200 a month, and she accepted that arrangement. Fortunately, things fell apart before I could actually get started with that, so my losses did end at around $350, but I'm still really bitter about that. Now, enter Kimi. I already had my doubts about Regina and her whole squad stories, but Kimi was the icing on the suspicion cake here, because guess what? Regina knows Kimi in real life too! Now, Regina once claimed to me that she was an actual shrine maiden who owned her family shrine, but I guess she thought I wouldn't remember her telling me that when she decided to redact that backstory and instead give it to Kimi. That's right, she told me she was a shrine maiden who owned her family shrine and then literally switched her own personal history in that regard with Kimi, who was now the one that was a shrine maiden. If that wasn't suspicious enough, Kimi was also promoted to curator about a week after she showed up into all of our lives. Keep in mind that during the original curator trial I was a part of, there were like six or seven of us to start with that went through a three-month trial that only myself and one other person that I'll call Red actually passed. But Kimi shows up, is promoted, goes through a one-week trial, and is a full-fledged curator. Within several months, they actually also promote her straight up to leader, 
despite having promised Eve that promotion for a long time. And Kimi is also an anime character stereotype, by the way. She's the super sweet, precious one that's only ever nice, and everyone loves her, or else, but moving on. At this point in the story, I'm very close friends with Eve, the only one of the original staff team that wasn't one of Regina's characters. And I open up to her about my suspicions that Regina, Stella, Iris, May, and Kimi are all the same person. And boy was I wrong to be worried about telling her that, because apparently she was thinking the same thing for a long, long time. And not only did I learn that, I also learned that there was a whole group of former staff members who also figured it out and got banned for it. I met them outside of Amino, heard their stories, learned that Regina had been telling people she has three months to live for years now, and that in all likelihood she was not sick at all. Upon further research of her name and address, I also learned that she did not live in an apartment with rent she couldn't afford, but a townhouse with her mother that was owned and not rented. She also wasn't Japanese, which is a super racist thing to lie about, which is only made worse by the fact that she fetishized Asia so severely that this very white woman claimed that all of her other characters were also from some part of Asia. But if that wasn't enough to prove it, I also tested and confirmed that all five of them had one IP address. So at this point, I go to Team Amino. For those of you who don't know, Team Amino is the group slash company that owns and runs the app. They don't moderate it themselves, they just let individuals make communities on the platform and run those communities themselves, but they do have terms of service that all of those communities have to abide by, and they do moderate those. Power abuse is something that goes against those terms of service, which pretty much sums up making five duplicate accounts with which to run a very large amino, and banning anyone you don't like or who catches on. So I assumed that when I went to Team Amino with proof of my claims, they would do something. And I assumed wrong. Many months followed of correspondence with them in which they said the words, we'll look into it, more times than I can count, and essentially said there wasn't enough proof for them to take any action at all whatsoever. Eventually, I couldn't take it anymore, and I hoped that by this point, Regina and I had built up enough of a friendship that she would tell me the truth if I confronted her directly. Even if she didn't, I couldn't keep dealing with this high school-esque drama, and as it turns out, she didn't. She denied everything, and I stepped down as a curator. I still maintained a close friendship with Red and Eve, the other curators that were real people, and I still kept bothering Team Amino to do something, and things went on like that for a while, until finally, Eve was promoted to leader alongside Kimi. Here's where a very important distinction becomes relevant. On Amino, there are leaders and there are agent leaders. Leaders have the authority to ban and strike users, but there's only one agent leader per Amino and that agent literally owns the community. They, and they alone, have the authority to promote other leaders, demote other leaders, and even delete the community altogether. Eve was a leader now, but Iris was still the agent leader, which meant that despite having more power, Eve still couldn't do anything to fix this. Fortunately, this series of events was very well-timed, because due to the amount of power that agent leaders have, Team Amino actually does do something when one of them becomes inactive. And given that she was a fictional character created by Regina, Iris's activity on this Amino was exceptionally low. So shortly after Eve was promoted to leader, Iris was demoted, and Team Amino decided to make Eve the new agent leader by default. I still don't know to this day if they chose her specifically because of the reports we'd all send in about the others, or if it was by default because Eve's activity was the highest, but I'm 90% sure it was pure luck that brought about that particular blessing. Eve demoted Regina and banned all of her duplicate accounts, and while Regina still refused to tell us the truth even then, it was finally all over. I was promoted back to head curator, eventually leader, and then eventually agent leader, and it was a big happily ever after until I ended up stepping down because real life wasn't leaving me with enough free time for it anymore. I'm still friends with Eve and Red to this day, and those friendships might be the only worthwhile thing to come from the three years of my life that I gave that awful app. Because God, is it physically painful to look back at all of this and think about how genuinely upset and wrapped up in this I actually was. Like, I really, really cared about this community and these people, and I don't regret that part. But to treat such unbelievable drama with such significance and importance for so long is just... Well, let's just say I'm not proud of how much I cared about what I can only reasonably refer to now as nonsense. I'm really glad to have gotten away from Amino. And after hearing so many people share their own experiences with it on YouTube, I've come to realize why, in my opinion, 
everyone has an awful amino experience to share. And that is, in my opinion, because of the way the app is built altogether. Letting people make communities to celebrate and share common interests? Cool concept, poor execution. Because Team Amino also lets these random people on the internet that are usually children or teens run those communities themselves. They give them the power to make their own rules, enforce them however they want, and essentially exist without any outside influence or overseeing, with the exception of Team Amino's handling of explicit content, bots, and trolls. Yes, every Amino has to follow the collective Amino terms of service, but there's nothing stopping them from making a million more additional rules and enforcing them to whatever extent they see fit. Like, there's literally an Amino that limits and monitors the number of memes you send in an hour. But that's not the only problem with giving teams of random, unqualified strangers that much power. It creates a hierarchy system that by its very nature allows and encourages drama and toxicity, because there's no semblance of fairness or democracy to it. The person who makes the community makes all of the rules and chooses all of the staff, with authority given to them simply because they made it first. There's no voting on who will run these communities. The members in the communities have no say in it at all whatsoever unless the staff choose to let them. And there is no one overseeing any of the people running them to make sure they're being reasonable and fair, and not, for example, creating five duplicate accounts with which to catfish and lie to their staff and users and then banning anyone who finds out. Every Amino is so completely isolated from all of the others and with no supervision or intervention from the app's actual owners, it's really, really easy for staff to be corrupt, for the communities themselves to become absolute disasters in every possible manner and extreme, and for members of any of these Aminos to get sucked into the drama and chaos that so regularly results from that. And their only real option for help is to go to the staff that are so frequently part of the problem because, and I cannot stress this enough, Team Amino does absolutely nothing. Like literally nothing at all. If you're not a bot, a troll, or sending explicit images or messages, reaching out to TA accomplishes about as much as banging your head against the wall, which is largely what talking to them feels like anyway. All of that said, please know that I don't mean any ill will or judgment towards the actual communities themselves. For every nightmare story, like the one I just told you, there's a wholesome one to match it. For every Regina, there's an Eve. There are going to be awful Aminos by nature of their system, but I'm sure there are tons of lovely ones out there too, and tons of staff who just want the best for their communities just like I did. My resentment lies almost solely with Team Amino and their handling of the app, and this video is not trying to call out individuals who use or like Amino, so please don't interpret it that way. Anyway, god this was a long ass video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it, because if there's one thing that makes a good story time video, it's airing out your embarrassing tales of misery for a few laughs. I'll be back tomorrow with a tour of my old traditional art, and you can vote on next week's video's topic via the Twitter poll linked in the description. But most importantly, please don't forget to enter my giveaway for a chance to win the tablet I used to make today's art and video. All you have to do to enter is comment, this ramen is my girlfriend, on my why artists hate being called talented video which is linked in the description, a card above, and the ending screen, so missing it is borderline impossible. You can also find more details out about the tablet and the giveaway rules in the first few minutes of that video, so check that out if you're interested. Anyway, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next video.